All right, we'll go ahead and start. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, so, I'll start off my introduction. My name is Dave Lomont. I work at Reddit as a software engineer. Uh, today, I work in infrastructure, and one of the responsibilities is managing the infrastructure infrastructure. Hi, my name is Brandon. I work at Reddit. Uh, I'm part of the data platform team, and we heavily leverage Airflow to manage data at scale at Reddit. It's a lot of data. So, yeah, so we'll be talking about Airflow at Reddit and how we migrated from Airflow 1 to Airflow 2. Uh, so we'll start off with like a infrastructure overview of this Airflow instance that we're working with that we migrated with. Um, so this is actually an Airflow instance that Data Platform uses at Reddit. This is our largest Airflow instance. To give you a sense of the scale, it had about 1,500 bags. Uh, of these bags, about 30,000 tasks run. And then we estimate about a petabyte of data is processed from these tasks that are shared with Airflow every day. So this is, this is a pretty big instance that we were working with here. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the old setup that we had and some of the challenges. So when I first came to Reddit, uh, what we had was this ancient Airflow 1 instance from an EC2. It was managed with Puppet, uh, but there was another problem where people have gone to this instance and installed all sorts of things manually, Python dependencies. Uh, so this is actually stuck in a lot of Python dependency hell. Um, we had a very strange bag deployment method for this. It was a very manual process. It required that you went into several servers and ran some code. It took about four minutes. It was just a total nightmare. Um, we used the local executor, uh, which was actually kind of a big bottleneck at the time, given the scale that we had. Uh, backfilling was nearly impossible. Uh, backfill basically requires that you need to access to this machine, which we don't want to give out, so people really could not backfill very easily. And at the time, Reddit was experiencing a huge amount of growth, so I think we went from like, 10 engineers to over 100 who were using this airflow instance. Uh, so it was very hard to scale this infrastructure that we found on PC2. And it made it worse, we had no storage in the environment. No real way to test things. It's a very archaic and chilly setup. So, the first thing we wanted to do in our migration was we wanted something more scalable than EC2, so we were very into the. So, yeah, so I think we wanted to go to Kubernetes. Kubernetes was very attractive to us. Uh, Reddit, we run our own Kubernetes clusters, uh, so this was very easy for us to uh, put Airflow on. Um, we like the way Airflow scaled on Kubernetes. Uh, with the old EC2 instance setup, it was hard for us. We, we can make a bigger EC2 instance, but it would always be running. It would always be costly. But we didn't need all those resources all the time. Um, so the Kubernetes executor is the executor we wanted to use on Kubernetes to take full advantage of it. Uh, we can put specific tasks on nodes that need extra resources. Um, use Airflow somewhat as a processor. And we really like the idea of having different containers for different languages beyond Python and Scala. Um, and then we could take advantage of the official Airflow Helm chart, which was, you know, more standard deployment method. That was very powerful for us. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the migration strategies that we considered on for the infrastructure side. Uh, the first one was an in-place migration. Um, so basically what this would entail is that we would upgrade our current EC2-based airflow to the bridge release. Once it was to the bridge release, we would update old uh, DAG code to be compatible with Airflow 2. And then finally, we would point the DAGs to Airflow 2 that is running in Kubernetes. Uh, this was a good approach because it was simple. People are only focusing on DAG compatibility. Um, and then all the DAG dependencies remain in place. Um, basically, all of our DAGs depend on each other with external pass sensors. So this is a big pro. Uh, but one of the cons, or some of the cons here, is that what we had installed with Puppet and what was actually installed in EC2, there was a big delta there. Uh, I don't think we really wanted to untangle that mess. Uh, I mentioned before that the Python dependency hell was 
horrible. Uh, we were scared. We couldn't really upgrade airflow or add new packages without breaking things, which is a very precarious situation. Uh, and then any amount of downtime that might occur trying to fix the previous two issues, uh, there's definitely going to be downtime involved there. So we didn't like that. The other strategy was shift to a separate Airflow 2 repository and a separate Airflow 2 instance that's running on Kubernetes. Uh, so this would entail standing up a new Airflow 2 instance on Kubernetes. And then we would shift all the DAGs to this new repository and update the code to work from Airflow for Airflow 2 from there. Uh, this was nice because our, our previous instance had a lot of tech debt. Um, this allowed us to start from a clean slate, based from best practices which is very attractive to us. Uh, and we don't need to modify that old Airflow 1 uh, machine, so maybe we wouldn't have any downtime. Uh, the problems here is that it's going to be far more time consuming than in place. You're asking people to move code entirely. Uh, we're not just migrating DAGs to work for Airflow 2. We're also cleaning up tech debt. Um, and then DAG dependencies could be tricky to handle because most of our DAGs are dependent on each other. You can't just migrate some DAGs slowly over time. You basically have to move them all at once. So, talk about the DAG migration strategy, the Big Bang versus piecemeal. I kind of touched on this, but everything is dependent on each other via external task sensors. So there's two options we can look at. One is the Big Bang, migrate all the DAGs at once. Uh, this is good because if all of our DAGs are dependent on each other, uh, basically, that's the only way around that. Um, but it requires a total code freeze. Um, so we would stop development sometime there. Uh, the other option is piecemeal, where separately migrate DAGs one group at a time. It's good because things are in smaller batches, but we didn't have a lot of options for that because most everything depended on each other anyways. Uh, that's probably the better way to go, but we kind of forced to go with the big game approach. Um, and so, again, most all of the DAGs are dependent on each other. There's just no way we can split it up. I think there was maybe like 10 DAGs we could have migrated piecemeal. So it just didn't make any sense at all. We did need to do a uh, code freeze, a large, but it was a brief code freeze. Everybody got involved and moved over the DAGs. So I kind of I took a screenshot of like our DAG dependencies. Kind of hard to see, but. As, as an example, just to show like everything really depended on each other. I think this takes like five or ten minutes to render and do airflow you want. So anyways, that's that's my example and I'm gonna hand it over to Brandon here. So that gives you a pretty good idea of the overall philosophy and the motivation behind the migration. So now we can discuss like practically <laughs> actual steps involved. So the first step we did was we wanted to make sure that the DAGs we're migrating over are actually DAGs we need to migrate over. So the way we did this was that we actually took an audit to see which DAGs are being used. So for some context, the vast majority of our DAGs, in this case, are reading from our data lake and writing to our data lake, just performing transformations in that data lake, in, in this case, it's BigQuery. So we we're able to associate the usage of a DAG with just how much the table that it was writing to was used. So you can see this code snippet. It was very simple. We were just able to find the mapping between a DAG and the table it wrote to just through parsing up the DAG bag and then extracting out the table that the BigQuery operator was writing to. And then separately, we tracked table metadata within BigQuery in a separate table that tracked how many times a table was referenced um, over you know the past 90 days, 120 days, you know, you know, any given time frame. And we just joined it. And we could just see, okay, you know, we have a DAG that associates with this table and it has this usage. And this way we were able to see DAGs that just weren't being used very much. And we were able to just filter those out and just got rid of like a good 20% of DAGs that we realized we don't even have to migrate them. So that was like very helpful for us. Um, in terms of the actual migration timeline, <clears throat> so and the steps involved, um, necessarily there's there's a code freeze. Like when you perform a migration of this scale, 
you have to pause development. Otherwise, code drift will start to take place when you have discrepancies between what is being developed on the old instance and what is being developed on the new instance. So you need to make sure that you have a code freeze and also properly communicate it. So you need sufficient buy-in from all your external stakeholders to make sure that, okay, we understand the value proposition of this and we're willing to forego development for a period of time. You also need good communication within your team because this is definitely a team effort. Um, everyone within your team has to be aligned and make sure that you can pull this off because a migration of this scale is definitely requires um, team effort here. And then practically speaking, a big change was actually swapping out all the Airflow 1.0 code, the parts that needed to be changed, which was in this case, a big part was using provider packages in Airflow 2.0. So having run books to document the exact steps involved that's very useful because when it comes time to actually migrate it, you don't want to be thinking up the steps on the fly. You should have everything step-by-step -step documented. So runbooks are definitely your friend here and you should have it all prepared beforehand. So these are just some practical steps you should keep in mind when you undertake a migration like this. <clears throat> so the other thing that we found useful was tooling. So you can actually take this as an opportunity to develop tooling that can make your lives easier and actually pay out dividends long after the migration. So in this case, we leverage the DAG factory pattern. Um, so what is a DAG factory? You may already be familiar, but just as a review, it basically it just kind of allows you to not have to directly write Python code. And some people don't like to do that. A lot of people, especially you know customers downstream, would prefer not to have to go in and write them directly, and this reduces boilerplate. You can just simply specify a configuration file, and then you can have a DAG factory spin it up into a DAG. So leveraging this is actually really useful. So prior to using this, the issues we faced in the old instance were there was no real consistent pattern for writing DAGs. All sorts of users would write DAGs according to their own style and their own preferences, and this created a pretty disorganized situation. Um, you know, naming conventions were not consistent. It was hard to look stuff up or track things down. Um, and just the structure of DAGs, you know, some used custom operators, others used more out of the box operators. Like there was real, no real consistency and it was prone to errors. And not only that, the errors could not be cleanly grouped into like, okay, this is an error that afflicts all of these DAGs and which we can solve through just one spot in the code. Each of these errors had to be tackled individually because all the DAGs were very disjoint. Another problem were these mega DAGs where users found it easier to just append a task to a DAG to accomplish what they needed to accomplish instead of writing a whole new DAG from scratch. And this you know, was understandable because it reduced boilerplate and it was easy, but this is sort of a shortcut that ultimately caused headaches because it made backfills very computationally expensive and very time consuming. And it was also a very brittle system. You know, one failure could impact a bunch of other failures because they were grouped together when they shouldn't have. Um, so how DAG factory helped in our case is that now all of these DAGs are written in a very consistent way. They all have the same uniform sort of structure. Um, they're very easy to make them self-serve. The user just has to supply a configuration file and you know, people really appreciate that. And also this saves us a lot of effort during migration because it's easy to add, you know, we can just find um, a set of DAGs that could all be powered by the same DAG factory and sort of make them consistent and uniform. And that is actually what we use to migrate a lot of DAGs over. And furthermore, it's easy to add new capabilities that just automatically apply to all DAGs. If you face an issue, it's easy to just apply a fix. And now that fix is applied to all DAGs with only needing to apply it to one spot. So more practically, how you kind of create your DAG factory is you need to find out what are the workflows that are actually being most commonly used. So this is per the 80-20 principle. Like you want to solve 80% of your use cases through you know, minimal effort. And after auditing, our DAGs, we found the most used operators. So this code snippet, again, it's very simple. You just go into your DAG bag and just 
take a rank of all the operators that are used and find the most common ones. So what we found is that our DAGs basically, you know, 80, 85% of them follow, follow the same pattern, which is they're sensing on some upstream tables, they're creating a new table and writing to that table. Potentially they might surface a view on top of that table. And then there's some alerting or notification steps involved, such as um, Slack and email or a main alerting operator, or potentially triggering some sort of uh, visualize some sort of dashboard in our BI tool. So this actually accounted for the majority of our use cases that a lot of data scientists and other customers are actually using. So basically that is how we took inventory of what's required to make a DAG factory. And through doing this, we saved ourselves not only a lot of effort in our migration, but also set us up for success in terms of having best practices for our consumers and downstream customers to use. Yeah, so we'll kind of end this with some of the main challenges and learnings that we came across. So I think the number one thing that we all underestimated was how difficult it is. Migrations are hard and they take a long time. I don't think there's any way to get around that. So maybe I, I think we could have been a little bit more uh, conservative with our estimates. Um, and then another big thing is it requires a lot of buy-in. So when you're doing a migration, you're basically asking everybody to stop feature development. You want to go back and move some things to, in our case, from one repository to another. Uh, you really need to make sure you have a reason for people doing that, a good motivation. In this case, it was easy because we were moving from Airflow 1 to Airflow 2, and Everybody wanted to take advantage of the new operators that are available in Airflow 2, and there was a lot of pains with Airflow 1, so it was an easy sell, but that motivation or selling that was, I think, key in making this successful. Um, I think another area that was challenging is the documentation of the new system. So I think at first we thought, oh yeah, everybody's already familiar with Airflow 1, but uh, so with Airflow 2, we don't need to teach them anything, or we don't need to document anything. It'll People would just pick up on it, no problem. But that was not the case. Uh, moving to Kubernetes um, changed a lot of things. The deployment, DAG deployment method, uh, how secrets are fed into Airflow, all of these things changed. We need documentation. Uh, maybe doing all of that work up front really makes the migration process smoother. Um, and then I think the other piece is making sure there's no interruptions during the migration process. When you're moving code around, it's very easy to break things. Uh, in things that are unintentional and maybe spending more time in that area to make sure there's no interruptions is probably a challenge that we came across that uh, I'd highly recommend spending more time on. So, And I guess for learnings, some key takeaways were this is really a team effort. You know, I can't emphasize this enough. You really need to have good communication and alignment within your team and also you know, internally, but also externally, you need that buy-in. So communication is totally key here. Um, and also, you don't want to have to rely on on-the-spot problem solving when it's migration time, because you have to remember this is, you know, you're on a code freeze. People are giving up their development time for you to pull out this migration. Time is very sensitive here. So run books are very essential for planning for contingencies. You should have you should know what to do in the case of failures. Think through beforehand what are the most common failure cases, you know, whether they're from code drift or you know, any type of failure case. Try to think through that beforehand and then document that in run books. Um, and also, we found it very helpful, again, to audit what we needed to migrate. You don't have to just blindly migrate everything. Actually take this as an opportunity to find out what you can clean up and what you can deprecate, actually. And this alleviated the strain for us and also improved our tech debt and set us up for success long term. Um, and finally, use proper tooling. You know, again, this ties into reducing tech debt and also using this as an opportunity to get onto better practices. Um, this will help you in the migration and beyond. So that concludes our talk and open the floor to any questions.